I invite you to be seated. And as I mentioned uh, earlier in the service, my name is Brian. I'm the pastor here at this church, and uh, there's so much I want to explore with us within this scripture, but before we go any further, I want to invite us to a word of prayer. So if you would pray with me. Gracious and loving God, this morning as we come to celebrate your risen son, we pray that you would have a word for us this morning that you would inspire us to live out the story of Christ and the early church and to love those who are in desperate need of a good word or a good friend. Be with us this morning and speak to us, we pray. In your son's name, amen. Amen. So I would just imagine and venture to guess that the scripture from the gospel reading of Mark this morning was not exactly what you had envisioned for an Easter sunrise or Easter morning service. You know, they leave terrified and afraid, they say, at their last words. It begins with the, these early followers of Jesus going to the tomb in the morning with this daunting question, who will roll away the stone? I mean, if you think about it, it probably took the Roman army to roll the stone in front of the tomb, and there just a couple followers were wondering who was going to roll away this tomb, and then when they get there and they see that it's empty, they're terrified. And I'm kind of a a Bible nerd. Some of you know that I really enjoy exploring different uh, Bible uh, history and theology, and one of the things that I really love about the Bible is that there's so many different ways to look at the same thing and see something different every time. In fact, I don't know if you know, we have four different Gospels. Each of the four tells the story of Jesus in a a unique way. You have the Gospel of Mark, which we read this morning, the Gospel of John, and of Matthew, and of Luke. And each one even actually has this sort of uh, way that they see Christ, you know, the suffering servant in Mark, or the priest in Matthew. And each one has this uh, vantage point that they try to show us, so we might see Jesus a bit differently. And I really, really love the book of Mark. I love the book of Mark, one, because it's the shortest. So if you hear me on that one, you can go for it. But I also love it because it's just like jumps into action right from the get-go. Chapter one, Jesus is baptized. Jesus uh, heals people. He cures. He sends out demons. He even calls some of his disciples. And he even goes off into the wilderness and is tempted by Satan. And it's all just in the first scene. Some of you who already have your opening uh, night tickets to a Marvel movie coming up, this week will kind of empathize with this, right? You know, if you know what I'm talking about, because it's just action-packed the whole way through, just like we see in some of these movies that are out there. And I love it. And I follow along every step of the way, and and throughout Lent, the journey up to this morning service, uh, I've been reading the Gospel of Mark and been going through it, and I've just been reminded at just the intensity and the excitement that's in the air. In fact, this was interesting because this is the first of all the Gospels. We know that Luke and Matthew, they actually used Mark's Gospel as they wrote their Gospel. And so a lot of the phrases, you'll have Matthew does one and Luke does the other, and they're pulling from one of their sources we know was the Gospel of Mark. It was one of the earliest ones, and you can just kind of feel this intensity and this excitement. But then it's ending. I mean, come on. It ends with this scene. Actually, if you open up your Bibles, you might be asking, well, it doesn't end with this scene, Pastor. Uh, But it it actually does. So our earliest manuscripts of the Gospel of Mark end with this scene, with with verse 8, and they were terrified and afraid. If you read your Bible, open up your Bible, if you have the app, you can pull it up there. There's two different alternative endings that people have added to that, or that later followers of the church added to that. And I know you're thinking to yourself, how'd that end up in the Bible? And that's a whole other Bible study that we can get into about how things ended up in the Bible. There's an entire uh, study, academic study called textual criticism that like explores why things ended up there and how they got there. Um, But what we do know is that the Gospel of Mark likely ended in verse 8. And so I don't know if any of you are like me, but I love movies with endings that are open. So, in fact, that's probably why I referenced that Marvel's movie. If you know what I'm talking about, the new Marvel's Avengers movie comes out. I'm not going to spoil it, but the first one in the series ends with this open ending. I'm not going to tell you anything else about it. But it just kind of leaves you hanging there. 
And I love these movies because these movies, they, they stick with you and they make you thinking about it. My wife always reminds me that she doesn't like those movies and she doesn't know why I pick them. She likes the chick flicks that wraps everything up into the box and it's, you know, you got your boat package and you can take away feeling so good and she even does the, oh, it's so cute at the end of it, right? Am I the only one who has a, a significant other that might do that? And she reminds me that, you know, like my, like my vision of the Bible, I like to get all nuanced, that I do the same with my movies. But I think that there's a reason why the writer of the Gospel of Mark did that. And I think one of the reasons is because, what I mentioned, that movies that end with this cliffhanger, they leave you wanting more, right? They leave you wanting more. And, and I think that you can take away from the Bible so many different things and you can spend your life devoted to studying it and I've spent years of my life doing that. But one of the po- most powerful parts about it is that it, it invites you into a story. It invites you into a story. And you know, one of the early practices, and I invite you to do it at some time in your life, is just to read through the Gospel of Mark in one sitting. It's a powerful story, and you're left with like this cliffhanger at the edge thinking, what's going to happen next? And the reason I think that we're left at that cliffhanger is because what happens next is the point of the resurrection. And the point of the resurrection is not that the tomb is empty and not just that Jesus has accomplished this amazing thing, which he did, but the point of the resurrection is that we continue the story. The point of the resurrection is that we continue the story. See, over the next few weeks, you have in in front of you that the series, The Things I Wish Jesus Never Said. And it's going to be a fun series because the thing is, is that if you read the scriptures, you'll over and over again find yourself scratching your head thinking to myself, I don't know about this Jesus. In fact, that was actually going to be the sermon title or the series title is I don't know about that Jesus. Because he says these radically counterintuitive statements. Statements that don't seem to make sense, like the last shall be first. And Jesus, over and over again, tells us these things that for all other practical purposes seem to lead to death. Love your enemies. Care for those that are sick. Become like the least of these. Over and over again in Jesus' ministry, he invites us into a story that our culture and the media and everything else makes us seem like foolishness. And so there we are following Jesus, and if you were with us on Good Friday, you know how that story ends. It doesn't necessarily end with that beautifully wrapped box with the bow on it and all. In fact, it ends with Jesus on the cross. And in fact, it ends like that for most of the disciples and much of the early church. The people that were writing this gospel, their stories was not going to end very pretty because they found themselves oppressed by the Roman government at the time and many of them were persecuted and many of them died for what they believed in. But there's more to the story. More to the story is just like these women that went to the tomb with the reality that Jesus' life seemed to lead to death. And in fact, it did. And they were wondering what was going to happen and who was going to roll away that stone. But then the stone was rolled back. And they were in awe and amazement that the stone was rolled back, that this life that seemed to lead to death actually led to death life. That, you know, caring for someone else as much as you should care for yourself. That emptying yourself like Jesus did to love those around him. These might seem like they might lead to death, but in fact, on Easter morning, we remind ourselves that they lead to life. And if there's anything that you can take away this morning, it's that Easter morning is an invitation for you to live the story. And I've been thinking a lot about what it means to live the story. I've been following this uh, book uh, called Story Brand by Donald Miller, and I've talked about it many times, but I've just been wrestling with it over the past year. How do I describe to people, how do I communicate clearly to people what this story means and what it means to live the story? 
And, and where I've kind of landed this morning is in the print on your bulletin. A life worth imitating. And see, the thing is, is that I can't claim for you that Christianity has all the answers wrapped up into a neat package with a bow. And life is going to be figured out, and it's going to be better, and you'll have the answers, and you'll have everything you need after becoming a Christian, or after following the story. But I remember my first time when I prayed to God, and I, I was at a Young Life camp, and I, we were told to give a, a moment of silence, and I, I went out in, in this moment of silence, and I said to God, I said, God, I have no idea if you're real. None whatsoever. I remember I was playing with some grass, and I said, but you know, like, you made this grass, or at least this grass is so intricate, I got to believe that there's something more out there. And so I'm going to believe what these people are saying about Jesus and about you, and I'm going to take this journey. And I, at that moment, when I was in high school, I decided to follow Christ. And it has been an up and down journey since. There's been times when I thought I had all the answers. There's been times when I thought I had nothing but questions. There's been times when my life was going great and dandy and I could thank God for the blessings. And there's times in my life when, you know, they weren't. And I've gone abroad and I've learned from people from different faiths and I've done all sorts of exploring in this journey and we don't necessarily have the answers, but we have this guy, guy who was God with us named Jesus, who I think that over and over again, if you go to the scripture, you will find someone whose life is worth imitating. That over and over again, as I, as I read the gospel, I see this man, Jesus, who pays attention to the least of these, who stops with the women, who everyone else would just kind of pass by, who, you know, spends time even with those who hate him. And there's something about that story that draws me back in. And over and over again in my journey, I've seen how God has shaped me and molded me and changed me on that journey. And as I was reflecting on this gospel of Mark, I was thinking to myself, man, this is exactly how it began with me. I didn't know what was going to happen. I didn't even know if I believed in this God or this Jesus guy. But I was there at the edge and someone had brought me there and I decided to take a risk and to follow this life that I believed that was worth imitating. And this morning, that's the invitation that Jesus, that God is offering to each and every one of us. And you, you might say to yourself, well, I don't know. That tomb, that stone is so massive, that broken relationship in my life, the questions that I have, all these things are so massive, and I respect that and I know that. But I believe the risk is worth it to step into the story and to begin to follow God and to have a life that's worth, not our lives are worth imitating, but his life is worth imitating. Because here's three things I know about living this story. One is that you can't go it alone. There's a lot of people out there who say, why come to church? Why gather together with other people? I can find God on the beach. And that's true. I find God at the beach every time I go. But there's something about journeying with other people. And here at Kailua United Methodist Church, we value that. We value our small groups, our choir, opportunities to gather with other Christians. And here's the second thing that I know. It's not because we're perfect. We don't have a life worth imit imitating. Christ has a life worth imitating. And if you think you're perfect, you're probably not. And if you think you're better than someone else, you're probably not. And if you think because I'm standing up here and I talk about how my journey began, that I don't have questions and that my kids are perfect, just wait until the Easter egg hunt and you'll see they're probably not going to be perfect. <laughs> but one, I can't go it alone in this thing called faith. And two, I'm not perfect, and that's the point. It's not us having the power to remove that stone. It's that God did it for us in Christ. And that nothing can separate you from the love of God. And that's the third point. That God does this work in you. You follow this radical life worth imitating with other people 
acknowledging you're not perfect, and we trust that God will do a good work in us. That's the story that we call our Christian faith. That's the story that the gospel writer of the gospel of Mark was trying to get us to follow. Because over and over again, if you read the gospel of Mark, everyone who followed Jesus didn't really understand what the heck Jesus was doing. The disciples were fools, they make mistakes, and it only seemed like Jesus had his stuff together, but then it led him to the cross. And here on Easter morning, each one of us are invited to believe this radical hope that whatever lays before you between whatever you want to become, whether it's a better parent, whether it's realizing a new future for yourself, a new career, trying to figure out where God is calling you, whatever lies in front of you and where you want to be, that heavy, heavy stone that has been rolled back by the power of God and you can go with others, you're never going to be perfect and God's going to be with you along the way changing you and transforming you and you're going to have ups and downs on your journey but God's going to go with you and the tomb is empty and the power of God's love is always for us and that even death cannot separate us from that story. Death has been defeated, it's been swallowed up in victory and Christ has risen and the power of God is with us and for us to be better versions of ourselves and to be like that guy who was worth imitating. And here's the thing, I can't wrap that into a box for you and call it a present and you take it home and you know exactly what you need to do. All I can do is tell you that this story and living into it is worth it. And that you can't go it alone. You're not perfect, so don't try. And that the power of God has emptied the tomb and goes with you and on your behalf. And friends, I tell you what, that is amazing news because I need that support every day when I wake up to be reminded that God's love and God's power is for me even when I might be against it.